Check out Bees Holistic Hemp's up-and-coming brands for gummies and relief rubs. Formulated with premium CBD, relaxation and relief are only a taste and touch away. Come check us out online at www.beescbdhemp.com. Free shipping on all online orders for a limited time only. That's www.beescbdhemp.com. If you're sick of bullshit TV that's always showing our people in a negative light, if you're looking for information that's simple and entertaining instead of boring, check out Business Bully TV. Business Bully TV has amazing programming from celebrity interviews, documentaries, and movie reviews. You can watch exclusive programming that you can't get anywhere else from today's power players. Business Bully TV is available for free on Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and streaming 24-7 and on demand at Business bully.tv Once again, this is David Banner from the David Banner Podcast. David, 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 This is Scott Parker, and I'm chilling on Tommy's Corner. God damn, Bob Dylan tried to scalp you. <laughs> Steal your house, kid gave you smallpox. <laughs> damn, no. God damn. God. <laughs> Tell us where you're from and how that helped mold you into the individual that you are today. I'm from Florida, born and raised in a little town called Gainesville, Florida. Uh, went to school in Tallahassee at FAMU, and now I live between uh, Los Angeles and Florida, about half the time in L.A., half the time in Florida. So I grew up a small-town existence, uh, you know, hunting, fishing, things like that. My father was ex-military, so, you know, that played a big influence in my early life and probably the things that I like to do now in terms of security, fitness, and also education, because he was big on education. My, both my parents are teachers, so I grew up in the educational system. So. That kind of influenced me as well. I went to college at the age of 16. I skipped a grade. So I was actually on a black college campus as a child, basically. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing can kind of mold you into being kind of a tougher person. You can either fall victim to that or you can rise above. I like to think I rose above it. You know, people in my classmates were 19 years old sometimes when I was 16. So, you know, you either got to sink or swim. And so uh, Going through things like that kind of prepared me for the things that I do now in terms of security, personal training, traveling around like that because, you know, I really don't get, get intimidated really by big circumstances or events because I've always been somebody that was kind of an underdog coming through the ranks and seemed to always somehow find my way. And uh, that, that goes back to my roots. I was biology, I was biology pre-med, got a minor in chemistry. I did my master's work in pharmacology. I was... Uh, um, I've always been athletic also. My mother was a competitive tennis player. My mother still competes at 79 years old. My dad was a competitive golf player up until just a few years ago. and He's 91. So I come from athletics and sports. And um, I was, uh, when I was, I was a high school teacher after college. I taught science at a high school down in Tampa. Shout out to Robinson High School, Port Tampa. And I started a boxing club with some of the kids there that played basketball and football. So we actually had a little gym that took us in and allowed me to sponsor them and taught them how to box. That was really my first uh, four way into what I'm doing now in terms of personal training was working with kids at a boxing gym. Um, I left teaching and got a corporate job in New York. And I used to work out with some of my coworkers in the morning before school and some of the executives there asked me if I could start training them. And that's really how I transitioned from just doing it as volunteer work to an actual gig. I was training executives at a pharmaceutical company I was working at. And, uh, but I'll tell you what happened, man, in terms of the celebrity thing. I uh, met a celebrity trainer out in Los Angeles and she was making like crazy amounts of money, dude. And she was working like three hours a day. But she was making as much money as a month in a month that I would make in four months on my corporate gig. And she was doing something she loved. And I was like, man, she has figured this shit out. I got to get up on this. So I started doing research and training a bit more and just kind of submerged myself into the life of personal training. And um, 
I got a promotion with my job and they relocated to me to Los Angeles. And that's how I started pursuing celebrity fitness. But it all started with coaching kids. That's how my whole love of it was bloomed in terms of coaching kids to, to box. The other podcast members always say you're the mean one of the crew. Where do you think that comes from? I think it comes from me always being the youngest because I got skipped to gray early. And so, you know how we are as a culture. We, you know, we fuck with people. We joke, we laugh, we try to bully and shit like that. So I've been going through that my whole life, but I never took it. You know what I'm saying? I was the type of person that if you tried something with me, even though if you were bigger than me, I might grab that light and hit you across your head. You know what I'm saying? Just to let you know right quick that I'm not one of them people that's going to take that. And I just kind of grew up that way. If you look at my childhood pictures, bro, I'm never smiling. It'd be eight people in my family smiling. I'd be sitting there like I can't wait for this shit to be over. I just always been like that, man. Even though you know I'm silly as fuck. Right. But I don't know. I just was always a person that just wasn't grinning and smiling like that, bro. And I also grew up not liking strangers. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't even know why. But I just never really took the strangers. You know that personally. Right. And, uh, you know, it's like Banner says all the time. People ask him, how does it feel to be this? Or how does it feel to be that? You don't really know how it feels to be who you are. It's just me. You know, and I'm not, if I'm not speaking to somebody and not having a conversation, it's not because I don't like them. I just don't know them. So I just don't have a lot to say. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, and you know, when I do say something, I'm really going to say something. I just don't, I'm not a small talk type of dude. That's what it is. I'm just not really into small talk. A lot of people have to fill up silence with talking. I just never been that way. And so people say I'm mean, but you know, I give anybody the shirt off my back. You know, you know how I am. I just don't be sitting around playing. You know what I'm saying? But I don't consider, Banner says I'm the meanest person he ever met. Now, I find mean things funny. I find humor and shit that a lot of people might not find humor with. Now, Sali finds, he has a similar sense of humor to me. And that's why we get along. He's just as sick as I am. But I don't call, I don't consider him mean either. We just, you know, we just unique individuals. We find laughter in strange places. You know what I'm saying? So, no, I don't consider myself a mean person. I will do mean things if necessary, but that's different. I'm not a mean-spirited individual, though, I don't think. Can you talk to us about your accident that you had when you were younger? Crazy story, man. It was um, the fall of my senior year of college. I was hanging out with some cats. We went to a, I'll never forget this, man. We went to a house party, Tommy, and they had a keg of beer. Me and my homie Mario took the keg of beer, drug it across the room, and set it on the couch between us. So we didn't have to get up to get our beer. We just wanted it right here. All right, we just ain't even our party. So we done commandeered the keg. We drinking, everybody's drinking. Time to go home, and they were driving me home. It was five of us in this vehicle, man. It was a Volkswagen Jetta. We were going down this country road in Tallahassee, Florida, and a car swerved over into our lane. And the dude that was driving went off the road, and when he went off the road, both the tires blew out. He tried to correct, he overcorrected, we shot all the way back across the street, it ended up into a ditch. And um, all I remember is the impact. And when he shot across the road, I must have grabbed the armrest with my left hand. And when it hit down into that creek, my arm twisted, but my hand stayed gripping the uh, armrest. So my forearm twisted, but my hand stayed in place. So it threw all the 11, 12 wrist bones that are in your wrist, it threw all of them out of their direct orientation and it broke my arm in three places. Uh, my head hit the windshield, so I had a big open wound over my left eye where you could see my skull and it was, windshield was stuck in it. Um, so a dude, I'll never forget this dude, Thad Heat, man. He went to college with us. I haven't seen him since this night. So Thad Heat, if you out there, I appreciate you, bro. You saved my life. He drove up behind us. He looked at me and said, man, you pretty messed up. I got to take you to the hospital. So he put me in his car and he actually drove me to the hospital. And um, I got to the hospital. I'm thinking they just going to put a cast on my arm and send me home. And the doctor threw the x-ray thing up on the uh, little screen. And he cut the light on. <laughs> he said, oh. You know, I'm 20 years old, I'm like, ooh, what is it? Ooh, he was like, oh, I'm gonna have to perform surgery on this. So, I told 
called my girlfriend at the time, don't call me. It was like three in the morning at this point. I was like, don't call my parents till in the morning. I don't want you to wake them up this time of night with this, because when I grew up, we had a lot of family tragedies and the phone would ring late at night and it would just be a lot of anxiety in the house. You know, I've had three or four family members killed in the middle of the night. And so I didn't want to put that anxiety on them until the morning. But man, they took me to surgery and I'm allergic to anesthesia and didn't know it. So when they put me on the anesthesia, my lungs collapsed. So I woke up about a day and a half later. My parents were standing over me, you know, and I thought I was dead. I thought I opened my eyes and this, I'm on the other side because, you know, time just unlapsed. And um, I had a ventilator down my throat. They had a pipe all the way down my trachea into my lungs. I couldn't close my mouth. They had my head taped to the bed. And I just did not know what was going on, man. And um, then they started explaining to me that I had a real bad reaction to the anesthesia. And um, they had me on a breathing machine because I couldn't breathe anymore. And uh, so a lot of crazy shit like that, man. It delayed my college graduation about 18 months because I've had to have three surgeries on this arm just to get it back. Even It happened in 1991. I still don't have no feeling in these three fingers because the nerves got severed. And I can't bend my wrist anymore. I can bend it a little bit, but... You know, not much. But um, I tell you, man, I had a cast on my arm for almost two years after that. And um, I had steel, you know, on the outside of my skin for a long time, bolts and screws to put these bones back together. But I tell you what, I was at a pool party at Florida State University and some of the football players were trying to throw me in the pool and I had a cast on my arm at the time. And... Um, I didn't want to get that cast wet. I knew I had stitches, staples, all kind of shit. So I'm fighting them with one hand. And I ended up having to tangle my arms up in the turntable. I was like, I'll pull all this shit in the pool if y'all don't let me fuck go. And that was the moment, that was the first time in my life I felt like I couldn't defend myself. I went back to the dojo probably two or three days later in a cast. And I started studying martial arts feverishly because I was like, that shit ain't happening to me no more. And that's kind of probably what steered me to doing what I am doing now, which is the head of security for different groups traveling all over the world. But that's when I really got laser focused on studying martial arts and learning how to protect myself and others out of that tragedy. Talk to us a little about your relationship with your father. Relationship with my father. Well, I think you heard me say earlier that he had a military background. He also was a very smart man. I went to FAMU at 16. My father went at 15. By the time my father was 19 years old, he had his master's degree in biology and he was already in the army. So he's always been a very high achiever. And he, uh, he instilled that in me. He didn't play no games when it came to education and he didn't play no games when it came to work ethic. And those are the two things that I always think about when I think about my father's, my work ethic and also my respect for education definitely comes from him. But, um, you know, he's still a cold cat right now. He'd be 92 in August. He'd be 92 in a couple of months. But he's still driving, still playing golf. You know what I'm saying? We still go fishing. You know, we still shoot guns. You know what I'm saying? That's my main dude. But uh, he just was very focused on making sure that I became a productive man in society. And he was not having anything less than that in his house. And uh, I think I get my self-discipline from him. Um, just like Lee was talking about in his uh, Tommy's Corner interview, man, it comes down to work ethic. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't be doing any of the things I'm doing now if my father hadn't instilled a work ethic in me as an early age. He used to charge me to use his lawnmower, bro, before I could go make my own money cutting grass. I had to pay him. Then I had to cut his yard and the pastor's yard next door before I could even get out and make my own dough. But he was just showing me that nothing in life was free, not even his lawnmower. He was literally charging me a service fee on his equipment, bro. But that's why I respect people's things now. That's why I don't come in here tearing stuff up. My dad taught me that at an early age. All those things that my pop taught me, I'm using right now. When I mentor kids, I'm mentoring kids in the vein of my father and how he mentored me. So we have a very close relationship. I like to think that I'm a reflection of him. How did you become such an animal person? I think that comes I think that comes from growing up alone, man. Uh, I'm an only child. And so 
my father didn't really, if I wasn't playing sports, I couldn't just run the streets. You know what I'm saying? So he didn't have that. So I spent a lot of time at the crib. And, you know, my dad always had dogs. I have a picture of myself with a police, a, a German shepherd my father got from the police department. I think I was like nine months old. I couldn't even stand up yet. And I already had a full-grown German shepherd as a pet. So that's where it started. My first dog was a police dog. And it just kind of progressed from there. I've just always been into animals. And, you know, unfortunately, I've been let down by a lot of people. But an animal won't do that. It's unconditional love. So I think that's another thing about it, too. And messing with animals, man, is kind of like meditation for me, bro. It's like a hobby, like training dogs. I used to collect a lot of reptiles. I was the cat that was in college that you would see on campus with the six-foot boy constrictor around his neck. That was me, always. People would come to my house and watch me feed my python rabbits as a hobby. You know what I'm saying? So it's just something I always enjoyed even as a child. And I even, I still, you know, my dogs and everything, I still fuck with that right now. It's just, I really have a love of animals. My exotic fish game used to be real tight. You know what I'm saying? I used to have a 100-gallon fish tank that I would really take care of that. But like, I think all those things were almost like counseling for me, like therapy. There's the things that I can pull, unplug from the world and just go do that and get lost in that for a minute because being a black man in this country, man, a lot of pressure, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of trauma. And so that was just my getaway. Some people use women. Some people use drugs. Some people use the gin. I've dabbled in all of those, but animals was really my, my release, my, my release from, from society, I would say. What pulled you to L.A. from Gainesville? Man, I tell you, um... I met this trainer, and I started really understanding how she was living. You know what I'm saying? She was living. She was, had created a very nice lifestyle for herself, working just a couple of hours a day. And I was like, it wasn't like she was some type of super extraordinary trainer. She knew what she was doing. But I was just like, there's a lot of opportunity out here that I'm not, mac- you know, I need to get a piece of, honestly. I just liked the fact that she was doing something that she loved and she was making crazy amounts of dough at it. So I orchestrated my own promotion at my corporate job to move me to L.A. They were moving me to L.A. for a new position, which I did. But I was going to pursue my own thing on my off hours. So I kind of created it myself, but I created it because I saw opportunity. And I was like, if I can go out there and get mentored by somebody that's already in the game, much like you did with Banner, you're getting better than any college, you know, internship. You're getting on the ground training. I mean, the first day I got to L.A., the next morning, it was 5 a.m., and I was at Tisha Campbell's house training her before she was going to shoot, um, what's that TV show she was on? All, no, uh-uh, that was Dwayne was on that. What was Tisha on with, with um, Damon Wayans? Oh, right. My wife and kids. So I would be training her before she went on set. And she had to be in the makeup chair at 6.30. So I was at the house at 5 a.m. the day after I got to L.A., like learning the ins and outs and nuances of celebrity training. You know, that's how I hit the ground. You know, just like, you know, Salih hit the ground with Banner. You were the Grammy winner. Learning the ropes, production, A&R, the whole music business. You learning from somebody who has a multi-million dollar business already that he built from the ground up. And he's got the accolades and awards on the wall to prove it. So what's better than that? So I couldn't wait to get out there. You know, so... I learned how to navigate the system through her because I didn't know anything about Hollywood. So I watched how she worked it, watched how she moved. I took the things that I thought she did well, incorporated the things that I thought she could improve on. I left to the side. But uh, it was like an unpaid internship, basically. But I still had my corporate job at the same time. So I didn't have to make that leap, you know, jump on the Greyhound bus and go to L.A. not knowing how I'm going to eat the next day. I had a six-figure gig when I went. But I went with the idea that if I can make that same six figures on my own terms, then that's really what I want to do. So that's how I got out there. How'd you meet David Banner? How I met Banner. Banner was in a movie called uh, This Christmas. It was um, produced by Will Packer, who I went to college with. And the publicist on that project, Arian Simone, was also a uh, graduate of FAMU. And so Banner had expressed interest in finding a trainer And I had been training a couple of other celebrities in town, so she linked us up. And um, I remember we got on the phone call one day, and I was like, hey, how you doing, man? Scott Parker, trainer. He was like, he started laughing at me. He was like, hi, I'm David Banner, rapper. (laughs) (laughs) And so uh, we linked up at the gym 
probably two or three days later, gave him, you know, a, a session just to see, you know, how I got down. 24 Hour Fitness on Sunset. And, uh, shit, we've been working together ever since. And, um, the first thing, man, is I think I did a good job with him in terms of personal training. Once I figured out where I thought some improvements needed to be made, Banner lost 18 pounds in the first two weeks. And I think that got his attention, like, you know, okay, this cat might really know what he's doing. And then from there, we kept on going over the next, like, six or seven months. Banner lost 82 pounds, I believe. And then during that time, I was teaching him how to box as his cardio. And that's how he realized that I had such a wealth of experience in martial arts and boxing. And so one night, he was just like, man, I got a club appearance. Can you come with me? Yeah. So I met him at his apartment. We jumped into Bentley, went to the club. Next thing I know, I got 10 Gs in a backpack around the club, and I'm just doing security for him. Not as a job, just because I'm there. I just naturally started navigating the club. And that's when he was like, I guess he saw that I could be his security. So that's when he st I started traveling with him. And so we just started working out together and traveling together. And from there, we started partying together. You know what I'm saying? So it just became like between our business and our social life, me and Banner was together every day for six years doing something related to business. Or even when we're partying, LA is partying with a purpose. You out being seen, meeting people. You know, I was with Banner when um, Get Like Me dropped. I did security on the video, you know, Chris Brown out there. And so it was a good time to be with Banner in L.A., bro. We worked that single all over the West Coast, bro. We had a good time doing it. Then I think that's when we really got solid, because you know how it is when a song drops, man. You got to be on it. You 27-hour work days, all of that. We worked the shit out of that single. And that's probably when we really solidified our friendship. And so. Ever since then, anything he's done, I've been a part of, and vice versa. You know? Was Banner your initial start at security, or were you doing it prior to meeting? Banner was my first um, security on a club run, House of Blues, that type of, that type of tour. Um, I had done big venues with Jill Scott and Maxwell. But I had never, I skipped the club security shit. I never did club security. I skipped the tours. And then so when Banner came, that's why I had to learn the club, the club circuit to work with Banner. But um, yeah, we did that House of Blues tour together. What made you get into security from being the trainer? Most of it is because in my training, I use martial arts and boxing. So most of my clients will say, well, damn, if you can do that. Can you do this? Now, I also have a cousin that was a SWAT team member down in Florida, and he was also a bail bondsman slash bounty hunter. So he would teach me a lot of techniques in that business because we would have to go get bail jumpers and, you know, bring people back that's skipping or whatever. So I learned a lot of hand-to-hand -hand stuff in a formal system that way from him, doing that kind of stuff. And he is um, Rita Marley's head of security. When she comes to the States, he works for the Marley family doing private security, so he knows that game too. So I learned a lot of what I knew about security from him, but mostly it was my clients knowing that I had a martial arts background and basically, can you come with me to this spot? And from there, you know, security isn't running around shooting people and fighting. If you fighting, going hand to hand, you really have messed up the job. You're not supposed to put your hands on somebody during security. You're supposed to avoid that. So it's really a thinking man's game. You know, there's a difference between being a security agent and being a bouncer. A bouncer waits for shit to start and then breaks it up and pulls the aggressive party and puts them out of the space. A security agent, you're not supposed to be fighting, bro. You got to get your client and navigate around that. You know what I'm saying? So it's really more of a thinking man's game. So from that standpoint, even though I can have myself, handle myself physically, I've never really had an act. Well, I take that back. The only fight I ever had with security, I was with Banner. I was with Banner in a church in Brooklyn, of all places. I was in that motherfucker rumbling two times. This dude, um, we were shooting. Banner was speaking for uh, Umar Johnson. He had an event up in Brooklyn at a church. And um, 
this cat wanted to walk right through the uh, through the scene where they were shooting. And the, the organizer was a young lady, and she was telling him he had to walk around the room, not through it. He was an older cat, probably his mid-50s. And he said he was not going to walk around. He's walking through. And she's like, well, sir, we're shooting. And so Banner's speaking at this time, and I'm standing in front of him. He's up on the, in the, uh, on the podium. And Umar tapped me and said, Scott, can you handle this? And I look back. And to me, that's a distraction. You know what I'm saying? I can't be back here messing with this dude. My client's on stage. And so he asked me again, because they were over there arguing. I guess it was getting loud. As soon as I went over there, man, the dude rushed the chick and tried to run through her to get through the room. A female, he rushed her. Boom! So when they made contact, man, I had to go grab him. So I put him in a wrist lock real fast. And um, we were at a door. And I took him and I hit the door with my elbow and I'm coming out the door <laughs> and he didn't want to go. He had his legs in the in the door frame. I'll never forget this time, man. I side kicked him so hard in the rib, in the knee. Boom! And that knee collapsed in that door frame and I snatched his ass out of there, right? Now all the Black Panthers rushing. So I still got him by the wrist and I got his head under here now. And we go into the second door. I rammed his head right into the, uh, you know, they had a little bar that pushed. Goo -goo, boom! I hit his head on the door. Because I'm pissed now. You got me actually in physical contact, bro. So anyway, I opened the door and the Panthers let him go. And I never forget, I took my foot and I put it in the small of his back and I shoved him out in the street. And I said, get this motherfucker out of here on this church grounds. I'm out there cursing. Slammed the door, went back in, standing in front of Banner. And he's on the microphone laughing at me. Damn, Scott, I didn't know you was going to be in here fighting like that. And we had the church. But that's the only time I've ever had like a full blown, I've had to push people here and there and move, you know. But uh, I, of course I'd have to be with Banner the first time some shit really popped up. Always with Banner.